Hi, thanks for taking a look at this edition of LSE at your desk. My name's Tom Merriman. I'm going to be spending the next 15 minutes talking to you about the inherent problems around designing software and web pages. It's a difficult task, but don't worry, I've got some tips and tricks from the world of big data to help you out. In particular, I'm going to tell you how to avoid the requirements trap. The requirements trap is the uncomfortable position you find yourself in when you're gathering requirements for that new web page or new piece of software. It's a difficult spot. Each requirement you gather seems to conflict with the original. You go round and round without making any progress. It's a position I'm familiar with, having spent some time there myself, and also seen a lot of people spend getting caught in the trap too. My background's in finance. I spent eight years working for Bloomberg, designing financial systems for derivative traders all over the world. And it's that fascination with the difficulty of designing great software and web pages that led me to LSE. I should say, along with a great fascination in how technology is changing society. And LSE is a fantastic place to study that sort of thing. It's packed with world-leading experts on everything from cloud computing, big data, social computing to mobile platforms. These professors and researchers behind me publish in some of the world's leading journals, and it's really world-class research. On top of that, no, this is not just another business school where you're going to learn how to competently run a business. This is a social sciences school where you're going to learn to critically evaluate different concepts and theories to come up with new concepts and theories. That is, you're going to be taught how to innovate. So, chances are, whilst you're watching this, sitting on your desk somewhere, perhaps peering at you out of your to-do list, is an item that says requirements. You might know it as business requirements, functional requirements, a web page request list. There's a number of different names for it. But it's all about designing new software and web pages, and this is a very hard problem. In fact, some of those problems are, as we'll see, unsolvable. And I'm going to tell you why those problems are there, and I'm also going to tell you about some big data techniques that can help. But this isn't a guide to Agile or Scrum. That's for a whole separate lecture. So anyone who's been involved in software development will recognize this particular cartoon. You start up there in the top left as the, uh, with the business sponsor putting together what they have requested. But by the time you've turned it into specifications and requirements, it's already changed. Then once you get architect and developers involved, it changes again. So that by the time you actually deploy it or roll it out, it's changed dramatically from how you originally designed it. And the chances are you're rolling out lots of fixes and patches along with it, which are going to cause you uh, some headaches in the future. And of course, ultimately, when you present it to the customer, it's vastly different from what they asked for in the first place. So why does this happen so often? Why is this problem so difficult? Well, back in 1987, a very prominent software engineer called Fred Brooks wrote a paper called The Essence and Accidents of Software Engineering. It's better known as the Silver Bullet Paper. And Brooks split the challenges of building and designing software into two problems, two groups of problems. The first one were accidents, and that's the problems that engineers face when they're turning requirements into code. And the second set are essential problems. These are the problems of actually gathering requirements, of turning those requirements into specifications that people can understand. And Brooks said these are the hardest of the two. In fact, they will never be solved, hence there will be no silver bullet to solve it. Now, this is also an area where Herbert Simon's work on bounded rationality comes into play. Simon challenged traditional wisdom by saying that even when humans are presented with all of the information they need to solve a problem, they might not take the most optimal course through it. And the reason is, is because they're influenced by all sorts of factors, including a sort of limited cognitive ability. We only have so much computing capacity of our own. Now, that's important in the world of software engineering, where we're trying to turn real-world problems, which are in their nature very complex and difficult, into something like specifications. So even if you understand the problem very, very well, you might not be able to communicate that in terms of specifications on paper. But we do have some tools at our disposal. The first of them is decomposition. And that's the process where you take a problem and you split it into its constituent parts. And the second one is abstraction. And that's the process of communicating a problem on paper into specifications to those engineers. And those two concepts form the foundation of traditional software design and development. But that's really only one half of the coin. Matthiasen and Stage in 1992 wrote what is a really important paper called The Principle of Limited Reduction. 
And what they said is that whilst analytical behaviour is actually really important for reducing complexity, that is, understanding the problem, it's experimental behaviour, better known as prototyping, which can be used to reduce uncertainty, that is, understanding how people will actually use the software. But relying too heavily on one on the other won't work. So if you use too much analytical written specifications, you're, not gonna, you're going to be left with uncertainty, even though you've reduced complexity. On the other hand, if you rely on prototypes, so you understand how people are going to use the software, you're left with a lot of complexity, because, for example, you might not know how to determine those figures that are being shown on screen. So, what's the solution? Well, you're probably already doing it. You know, for example, that building really good software and web pages relies on a mix of prototypes and specification. And you probably also know that the best requirements come from when you see people using your software or web page in the real world. And that's something that another very prominent information systems academic called Wanda Orlikowski calls situated practice. Now, what about the projects that I worked on at Bloomberg and what uh, tips do I have for you from the world of big data to help you out? Well, you've probably heard a lot about big data, and in essence, big data is about drawing conclusions about everyday phenomena using very large data sets. Rob Kitchen last year wrote a fabulous book which is a great primer on the subject. Big data techniques are used widely by software and internet firms across the world. In particular, they use A-B testing. A-B testing is the practice of having lots of different versions of a home page and using statistical analysis to determine which of those designs is best. Google use it a lot. Each time you go to the Google search page, they have lots of different versions which you may land on. By tracking your usage, they can determine which of those versions is set up the best to help you solve the problem you're trying to solve. And it's this technique that can help you avoid the requirements trap. And I'm going to tell you how that works. So, in the projects I worked on for Bloomberg, these two in particular stand out. They're about leveraging the first mover. And let me tell you what I mean by that. The first project was about replacing a function where we had about 17,000 users visiting our page about 50,000 times a day. We implemented a graduated opt-in, opt-out rollout. It's quite standard. It works like this. When you have your new piece of software or your new web page, you give users the option to opt-in by clicking on a drop-down or some sort of checkbox. Once that's been running for a few weeks, you then opt everyone in and allow people to opt out if they don't like it. Then, after a few more weeks of running it like that, you opt everyone in, hopefully, after fixing the problems that's been causing some people to opt out. We tracked the usage on this, and what we found was very interesting. We found that 5% of our users voluntarily switched across. We called those the first movers. And that was interesting when it came to our second project. In our second project, we were trying to replace a function where we didn't really know how our users were using it. So what we did was to take a sort of agile approach. We split the budget into three sections. In the first section, we built a lightweight, simple uh, version of the new software. We included just enough new functionality to attract those all-important first movers. Once they'd been using it for a while, we'd built really sophisticated usage data software, data gathering software to understand exactly how they're using it. And we used that data to feed into the second stage. Essentially, we built our requirements around that usage data. And it was that second stage, the very large phase of the build, where we put together what would be the final version. Once we'd opted everyone in, we had a few people opt out, just like in the previous project, and we used the final part of the budget, a small part, just to fix those final problems that were causing people to opt out. That turned out to be a very effective method, not just for completing the project goals, but also for hitting business goals as well. And it's a mix of some of the theory we've seen. We can see that by using those first movers, we're using Orlikowski's situated practice to see how people use software in the real world. And then we're also using the prototyping that Matthias and Stage talked about to reduce the uncertainty of how that software is actually going to be used. And finally, we were using that, that um, usage data to build our requirements list. That specification reduces the complexity of the problem. So it's all three of those goes into a very successful method for developing software and web pages. So can you use it? Absolutely. The next project you have, try it out. Split it into three phases. In that first phase, build a lightweight version with just enough functionality to attract those all-important first movers. In the second phase, 
Use that usage data from those first movers to come up with your list of specifications and spend most of your money, most of your budget, building a solid version of the software or web page in that second phase. Finally, once you've opted everyone in after a few weeks and continue to track their usage data, fix the remaining problems with that third and final quite small section of your budget. So, when is it good and bad to use this particular approach? Well, it's especially good when you don't really know how users are use, going to use or using your software or web page. And obviously it's great for software and web pages that have high rates of human interaction. It's good if you're building on a fixed budget, but of course you have to have an environment which is supportive of beta versions. And when not to use it? Well, if your first movers are not representative of your wider audience, there's not much point in using it. And also, if you're designing very basic software, or if you're really confident you know the requirements very well, there's no point going to all this uh, extra um, effort. Finally, if you don't have the ability to gather that usage information, again, this is not a good technique to employ. Now, how does this match with the theory? Well, sadly, we have not found the silver bullet that Brooks predicted we wouldn't find. But what we have found is that through a combination of Matthiessen and Stage's prototypes and specifications, we're able to reduce uncertainty and complexity at the same time and employ both of those techniques along with Orlikovsky's situated practice to understand how people are really going to use that software in the world, real world. So, in conclusion, well, the problems around developing great software and web pages are never going to go away. They're inherent, they will never be solved, but through using a mix of big data techniques with prototyping, specifications and situated practice, you can avoid the requirements trap and build really great software and web pages. Thanks very much for watching.